last Sunday, uh, as I was living, so one of the ladies uh, asked me, what are you going to be preaching about? And I said, I don't know. God hasn't given me yet the word. Uh, but I said, because it's going to be on the eve of the old man's day in Russia, probably I should do something about military and about this stuff. And she said, no, 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 no. preach about men. <laughs> preach about men. I said, okay, done. So we'll talk today about some men of the Bible. And uh, so the first question that I have for you, and we'll see, let's just see if the technical part will work here. And if it doesn't, so yes. So the first question is, what does the world say about being a man? What does the world say about being a man? It's not a rhetorical question, it's a question to you. <laughs> Well, sometimes, uh, okay, there are quite a few conflicting views about it. And some think, uh, some think that first of all, it's all about being robust and strong. And guys, after the shower, we come to the mirror, like, look at our abs. Mm, whoa, looks good. <laughs> and we feel like it's, the, it's a good beginning of the day. I'm not saying that we should not strive for being physically fit. It's good. Because our body is the temple in which the spirit dwells. And we need to take care of it. But it's not the only thing about manhood. Some people believe it's about great determination. Well, yes, it's a part of it too. And uh, ladies, I think you will appreciate if men are really sensitive. Yes. Yes. Uh, but do you know that men do not take hints very well? <laughs> they prefer a straightforward answer. Are you going to marry me after all or not? <laughs> so that's what they understand, that this is the, the breaking point. That some action should be taken at this point. But nevertheless, these are all kind of ideas about men. And uh, we need to also to know what the Bible says about being a man. Who is the man? And in order to understand it better, we need to learn, and maybe just review some of the stories in the Bible, but great men of the Bible. You know, the good part that we have about Bible characters, that even though we consider many men from the Bible as saints, nevertheless, as Brother Daniel preached many times, they were real men with real problems, with real sins, real blemishes, and all kinds of situations in their lives. And in this sense, we can say that the Bible gives us a very practical piece of advice as to what we should be looking for in men. And if you look at just some of the characters, what about Adam? What happened to him? He ate the fruit of truth, of good and evil, and what did he do? Thank you very much. He blamed Woman. Who said woman? <laughs> man. A man said he blamed woman. Men know who to blame. <laughs> so that's Adam. So how about Abraham? At least two times, he comes to a foreign land, and he tells the king and his people that his wife Sarah is his sister. Wonderful. <laughs> a, the, one of the greatest men of the Bible comes to another country and tells the king, okay, oh, she's my sister. Oh, she, oh, yeah, she's very beautiful, very beautiful. And praise God that God saved this king, telling him in a dream, don't you dare to touch this woman because she's Abraham's wife. But nevertheless, he lied on several occasions. One of the greatest men of the Bible. How about Jacob? Some schemes just to get his way. How about Moses? Oh God, I'm not a good speaker. Oh, what are you talking about? Leaving people out of Israel? How can I do that? All kinds of excuses. So Moses, one of the greatest men, and we'll talk about Moses in a minute, one of the greatest men in the Bible, he was making a lot of excuses. So how about Solomon, one of the wisest men on earth, one of the richest men on earth? Actual made some stupid things at the end of his life. Elijah, Elijah, any one of you have experiences, okay, this uh, 
state of soul when you go from euphoria to complete depression. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sometimes happens. So that's being bipolar. That's a, actually, it's a disease. <laughs> it happens too often. It's, if it's an occasional thing, it's okay. It just happens. But if it's on a regular basis, it's a disease. So you need to see a doctor. Okay, we have lots of doctors. Okay? Uh, but nevertheless, Elijah just seemed to have this, this kind of attitude and sometimes a state of mind and state of soul. Peter. Peter had a problem of having a foot in his mouth occasionally. He would say stupid things. And uh, the list can go on and on and on. So again, these are real people. These are real men. Nevertheless, we consider them to be some of the greatest men that ever lived on this earth. And there's quite a, there are quite a few things that we can learn from that. And so let's start with Moses. And uh, as you remember, his life started that his parents wanted to save him by putting him into the Egyptian, into the Pharaoh's family to be taken care of. And uh, I would assume that Moses had some of the best teachers in Pharaoh's house. So would you agree with me that in the Pharaoh's house they had the best teachers? Because I'm a teacher, I just assumed that he had the best teachers. And uh, very possible that those teachers did not teach him about the God of Israel. And nevertheless, Moses was consistently in tune with God's leading. Apparently, he loved the people of Israel that he was able to give up. He could have the throne of Pharaoh. Imagine this. He could have had the throne of Pharaoh. And he gives everything up just to be with the people of Israel just to be with his own people, just to give them freedom that God promised. And he had really this faith and this sensitivity to God's word. And so we probably know Moses for this thing. And by the way, Brother Daniel, can you just come over here? This is your Moses today. Okay, take the staff. We'll need it. And now just uh, let us just see what we really remember Moses by. Because he knew that if God told him to go to Pharaoh, he needs to go to Pharaoh. So you want to take this? Okay, I'll sit with me. <laughs> When he comes to Pharaoh first, he hears from God something like this. Moses, way down in Egypt's land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people
soon. <laughs> because Moses was not prepared, he just trusted God. He trusted that God had everything for him and just to stay for the time being. Uh, I guess that was perfect. He was not prepared, but he still comes to the Pharaoh, he does it, and finally after 10 plagues took place, Pharaoh says, okay, go. And all the people of Israel just go after Moses, and that happens one of the greatest things in the history. And what happened? One of the greatest things in the history that is associated with Moses. Okay. Here we go, here we go, yes! They're walking, and they're going, and... Uh, Pharaoh, who had his senses to let them go, all of a sudden changes his mind. And the people of Israel, as they walk away from Egypt, what they hear? They hear the Egyptian army following them. Brother Daniel, it's all your fault. <laughs> it's all your fault. And you know what the interesting thing is? When we're taken out of bondage, all of a sudden we face the first difficulties. What do we do? Wait. Number one, we complain. Number two, we say, take us back to bondage. <laughs> That's exactly what the people of Israel did. That's exactly what is still happening today. We still want back into the bondage because we had some good things good things there. So people begin to complain. And you know Moses, who was the true man of God, and who knew what already happened. So he said to the Israelites, Israelites right here, just be convincing. Do not be afraid, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and he shall hold your peace. That was very convincing. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly what Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14 say. says. That's what... Moses told the people, and then he heard from the Lord. You hear from the Lord, you do what the Lord says. Lift up your rod. Lift up your rod. And stretch out your hand over the sea. And divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Okay, now we're going to just part the sea like it happened. Okay, praise the... Okay, the cameraman is your middle part of the sea. Okay, this sea just go to this side. Just lean over. Lean over. Okay, this part, lean over to this side. Lean over. Okay, that's the parting of the sea. The parting of the sea is happening and the Israelites go on the dry ground and then the Bible says that on the right, okay, on my left, okay, the water became the wall. Okay, please, two rows, stand up. Just two rows, just two rows. Little, middle, middle, go down. Just the big two rows. The two rows. Okay, that's the wall from the water, and then the two rows from this side. Please stand up, yes. No, no, keep standing, come on. Lord hasn't, hasn't come to see yet. Okay, these are the walls. And that's how the Egyptian, uh, sorry, how the Israelites were walking through the sea, seeing the wall on one side, then on the other side. And then, once they passed through, the Egyptian army started.
cry and see them no more. Moses, give a big hand to Moses. So, go down, Moses. <laughs> Moses did exactly the right thing because he was the man of God. He had faith and that one of the greatest miracles in the history of the world happened. And by the way, you can read a lot of scientific accounts because scientists are still trying to figure out how it could have happened. That the sea really got parted, that the Israelites were able to go through the Red Sea on the dry ground. And of course there are a few lessons that we can learn from Moses and from his experience. So number one, number one, despite all the difficulties, despite this, the situation he was in with the people of Israel, it was like hanging on the edge of the cliff by the teeth of your skin. It's like you're going down the cliff on a rope and all of a sudden, oops, this is the end of the rope. And there's quite a height under your feet and you have nowhere to go and so those are the cases those are the cases when we need a major miracle these are cases when our company is on the verge of bankruptcy this is the situation where people are on the verge of dying after a car accident these are situations when marriages are going to be broken and nothing but the miracle of God can save the day but Moses knew that he is cunning, not in his own strength, but he is cunning in the strength of the Lord. Amen. And that's why one of the lessons is, if you're stuck at the end of the rope, remember what God did for Moses. If he parted the real Red Sea for Moses and for the people of Israel, he can part the little Red Sea that you're crossing. Number two, however hopeless the situation might seem, remember that nothing is impossible with our God. And I want us to repeat it together. Nothing is impossible with our God. So let's say it again. Nothing is impossible with our God. So ladies, if you're looking for a man, don't look for a man in nightclubs. <laughs> Look for men who know that nothing is impossible with our God. And also remember that if you have faith, God will part your Red Sea for you. It takes faith. It takes faith. It takes pressing on. It takes asking God to help you out. And also it takes believing that it will happen. I'll tell you just about one of my experiences. Uh, it was in Kazakhstan. And uh, the people who run the school of tomorrow there are Muslim people. They run a Christian school. They're founders of the school, and so they hide people, but they believe that what we have from the Bible is good for the children of Kazakhstan. Yes, they do not quote some of the Bible verses, but they do quote the verses themselves. They don't call the references, but they call the Bible verses. And uh, so one day they, I was visiting with the school and they took me out um, to a Muslim pilgrimage, uh, which was just a little tour of the mountains where they show, showed me the place uh, which is called the uh, Eve's place where you have to go through the, uh, a little crack in the mountain. <coughs> They showed me the place where Noah's Ark assumedly landed. They showed me all the biblical things in the stones there. And then, then at the end, uh, the guy who was, uh, I believe a mullah or something, okay, one of the priests, okay, uh, he just took us to a little well. And he said, now I'd like you to drink out of this well because the water they is saint. Let me drink some water. <laughs> And there were mugs, tin mugs, on the side of this little well. And they looked rusty. <laughs> and they looked as being used by thousands of people. <laughs> and uh, I looked around and I, don't, I didn't see anybody washing those mugs. <laughs> and my, the first thought that flushed, 
flashed through my mind. Oh, am I gonna just <laughs> drink out of those mugs with all the germs from other people? And then the man went on. Um, you can just drink those mugs uh, just the way you want. Uh, and he said, and, and as you drink this water, it's good for your heart. It's good for your blood. It's good for your bladder. It's good for your joints. And the list went on and on. Okay, mercy, it was very medical, the way he described it. Very medical. He gave me, he, he was using words of some, uh, some parts of the inside of the body that I didn't know, even in Russian. So this man was very sophisticated and he just knew, knew it all. And I just thought to myself, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> this water helping just all those diseases and can rectify your eyesight and can improve your hearing and uh, even impediment of speech can be improved. I said, what? <laughs> he said, anyway, he said, think about something that you have as your problem and drink this water. <laughs> we did. And then the man said, now I can tell you something. This water is nothing if you don't have faith. Yes. That was interesting. That was interesting. I thought he was, he was speaking the Christian way. Unless you have faith, nothing will happen. So God demands not only asking him for help, but he wants us to have faith in him. And uh, again, at this glorious moment, when Brother Daniel was standing here as Moses, and when the Red Sea parted and then it just closed up over the armies of Egyptians. Is Brother Daniel still here or he's, he's in the youth group? Okay. I'm sure that as Moses he felt elated and he felt really great. There's a danger. There's a danger to fall into the pitfall of pride and to think that I did it. The moment it happens, the moment you believe that somehow you did, thank you God for giving me a little bit of a hand, but it, the moment it happens, so it won't be happening again. And I believe as Moses was doing it, we need, he was aware of this particular thing that Paul wrote in the second Corinthians uh, chapter 3. And such trust have we through Christ to God one. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. We need to remember this. Man, we need to remember this. At the, at the very glorious moment of our life, when something great happened, we need to remember it's not us, but our God is sufficient for everything. Another man of the Bible that we can draw on. And I'm sure that you have all kinds of your own examples. So another man is David. And David is just another character. <laughs> another character who had all kinds of troubles in his life. <coughs> if you remember, one of the greatest men of the Bible, he committed adultery. Also he conspired to commit murder. And then, those of you who are lawyers, premeditated murder. And nevertheless, he was called a man after God's own heart. Doesn't it give us hope to all of us sinners? That even this man was called by God as the man after God's own heart. And just as we examine the life of David, we can see why God elevated him to such a great position and that he became a member of the Hall of Faith. Not the Hall of Fame, the Hall of Faith. So he found, when, he found, uh, when God found David, he said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And as we read the book of First and Second Chronicles and the books First and Second Kings, we find out about David's life. But most of all, we find out about David from the book of Psalms, where he really opens up his heart to us. And that's where we know what kind of a man he was. And his heart was always pointed towards God. And as we examine David, we can say that first of all, uh, so the first one was he had 
Okay, here, here you go. Absolute faith in God. David had an absolute faith in God. When he was going to face his, the giant Goliath, what did he say? Why did he go there? Why was he so courageous to go out actually into almost an impossible situation when all the great warriors of the Israelites army said, no, no way, no way, not me. And David, the small shepherd boy, nevertheless, he goes into the battlefield and he is ready to slay the giant. When he was talking to Saul, the king, he said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So he had absolute faith that if God already delivered me, and by the way, ladies, if you're looking for a man, so probably you should be looking for a man, if you're looking for an African man, he should be delivered from the paw of the lion. <laughs> if you're looking for the Russian man, he should be delivered from, delivered from the paw of the bear. You see, it's biblical. It's my interpretation, but it's biblical. If you're looking for a Filipino guy, throw from the shark. Okay, from the jaws of the shark, okay? It's not in the Bible, but okay, it's fine. But that's what David remembered, that God delivered him from the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion. So he was ready to go out and he did slay the giant. So he was the one with absolute faith in God. Number two, he also absolutely loved God's law. So how many Psalms do we have in the Bible? Yeah, here were 150. 150, 50, that's correct, 150. And David is credited for writing over half of the Psalms. And that's why he opens really his heart to us. And uh, he says that in Psalm 119, for I delight in your commands because I love them. I lift up my hands to your commands, which I love. And listen to this, and I meditate on your decrees. So David truly loved God's word. Not only he read, by the way, how are you doing with reading the Bible through the year? Pastor Jerry is posting reminders. Please read today Chronicles 1 and 2. Please read today 1 Kings. Okay, silence. <laughs> I can tell you, I'm about eight chapters behind already. Not a good example. I'm trying to catch up sometimes listening before I go to bed, uh, just audio Bible. But yeah, keep doing it. But you know what? It's not enough. It's not enough because we need to meditate. And in Psalm 119, that's what David is writing. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and see him with all their heart. Okay, who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. Only if we not only read, but we continue meditating and we continue applying God's word, then we do nothing wrong. Thirdly, David was really thankful. He was truly thankful. And he had his ups and downs in life, his great moments and his miserable moments. But he was thankful all the time. And if we look at Psalm 100, in Psalm 100, one, two, three, yes. The song that we sing sometimes, even. Well, in our school we sing this song at our devotions and sometimes at our church too, so we sing it. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. That's Psalm 100. Let's just sing it together. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving.
bless you. And I want you to remember that David was the one, David was the one who wrote this song that we sing. And uh, this attitude of gratitude that he had in his heart was something that uh, pleased God and made him the man after his own heart. And then David was truly repentant. David was truly repentant. Uh, you remember how it happened when he saw one day a woman bathing? That Shiva guys did it to us. Man, this is a story to us. When he saw a beautiful woman bathing and he asked to bring her over and he laid with her and uh, she got pregnant. She was the daughter of L.A.M. and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And that's why David had this pre, uh, preconceived murder when he sent, sends the man to the battlefield where he gets killed. And Prophet Nathan, he challenges David and he said <coughs> that David did the wrong thing. And why David was the man after God's own heart? Because David admitted to his sin. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan knew that he was truly repentant. Because admitting our sin is not, it's only half the way. The second part is all repenting, which means that we turn away from our sin. And that's why Nathan said, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. In Psalm 51, Psalm 51, we read, Have your mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I will be all need to read this. Let's just read it together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That's what we need to remind ourselves often often enough so that God would cleanse us from our iniquities and from our sins. And that's why David, being the way he was, just was called by God the man after his own heart, demonstrating faith on a daily basis, having actual faith in God, loving God's law, being truly thankful and being truly repentant. There are other men in the Bible other men in the Bible, Paul, and his story is really, is really sad because he says that three times I was beaten with rods. Oh no, before that, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers. And Pastor John, I remember you being in danger from, from the river when you went to Karelia. And Pastor John jumped right into the whirlpool and came out of the whirlpool in one minute with his knee bleeding. Danger adrift at sea. Danger with robbers. Danger from my own people. Danger from Gentiles. Danger in the city. Danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, <coughs> in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from all other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. That's Paul, one of the greatest men in the Bible. What a hard experience. Abraham the faithful, Abraham who was willing and who obeyed God when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. <coughs> and he went out not knowing where he was going. Man, are you ready to go when you don't know where you're going? 
when you only know that God is calling you. That's the man after God's own heart. John the Baptist. John the Baptist who paved the way for Jesus Christ. And the one who was not politically correct. He was talking like this. You brood of vipers who want you to flee from the coming wrath. Ooh, not nice address. <laughs> Imagine somebody is preaching to you, you brutal vipers! <laughs> but John the Baptist did not care because he was paving the way for the one who was coming after him, the way of Jesus Christ. He was the messenger before God. Job was another character who said, even though he slay me, I will trust him. Who was prepared to take any beating and any hardship and he had it in full but he said that i'm ready i'm prepared and i will bless the name of the lord he, he used to say the lord gives and the lord takes away blessed be the name of the lord i once shared a story about my great grandfather jacob he was a baptist bishop and when the 11th baby was born into the family the baby died the police and the medical people came and they asked what happened. And you know, my great-grandfather Jacob said, because he was a man of God, he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. That's why the, the child died. And the police recorded that the little baby was killed in a religious sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> and my great-grandfather was put into prison where he died. There are two records that he was actually uh, put to death by shooting, and the other record has has it because we didn't know, we don't know still what really happened to him. But that was Jacob, that was Job, who was prepared to take anything and still bless the name of the Lord. David, or Daniel, Daniel the courageous, Daniel who was prepared to go down the lion's den but not to worship a false god. He knew did not exist. He did not want, even at the expense of his own life, to sacrifice his true and only God. And God delivered him from this predicament. The list can go on and on. There are so many other men, great men in the Bible. But the most important thing is that all of them were pointing out to just one greatest man. They were pointing out to Jesus Christ. They were all pointing, pointing out to Jesus Christ. And if any one of us, I'm talking to, about men today because we have the evil of the men's day. If you want to be a true man, we need to look at Jesus Christ. We need to look at his life. And we need to be as obedient as he was to his father's will. We need to be doing things, always remembering about our Heavenly Father's business, as Jesus did everything, remembering about His Father's business. And like Jesus Christ, we should be able to shun sin and follow after righteousness. We need to seek the power of the Spirit, to seek to keep God's law in our heart, like other men of the Bible did as well. And need to live in God's will, like Jesus did. And we need to have determination to accomplish God's will. And we need to be able not to lose heart, whatever the opposition is. Today, as we were praying for the nations, we were praying for a lot of Christians being oppressed today because of their faith. And who are still willing to follow Jesus Christ despite all the opposition. And we need to be a man of word, of God's word. And we need to use the scripture to overcome temptations. Because those temptations come every day into our life. And unless, unless we resort to the only source that can help us, we will fall into those temptations. And we need to be men of prayer. And we need to be men of love and men of sacrifice. That's what Jesus is all about. And if you don't remember anything else out of this sermon, just remember this, that the life of Jesus Christ 
is the greatest example of being the true man.